Actually, before I um, introduce myself, I would like to say thank you very much to the organizers of this first Pylon Dinium for the huge effort they've put in. It's a really, it's quite a big job to do the first edition of a conference, and they've pulled it off with a lot of aplomb. And I know they've mentioned about the little crises, but probably most people haven't even noticed those little crises un unfolding because they've been dealt with uh, beautifully. So thank you very much to all the organizers. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and of course, um, thank you to Bloomberg for hosting this and uh, sponsor their sponsorship of the conference of Python in, in general. It, it's valuable, it's needed, it's really important. And um, uh, I think that I can speak for uh, everyone to say that we're, we're grateful for it. I should also say, I'm, I'm, I don't know who the individual was who signed off on, on, on agreeing to have a, a Python conference here in, in, in uh, the Bloomberg headquarters, but thank you to them as well. Make sure that they, they hear that. And, and finally, thank you for inviting me, because that's honestly a big honor to be invited to um, speak to you. Um, so that, that's me. That's what I look like on television. And I, I, I don't tire of pointing this out, but it says, you know, I'm Python software. <laughs> so, um, and uh, my, my name is Daniele Procida, by the way. Uh, I work for Divio, uh, Divio.com. We're a, a Python Django company. We provide cloud hosting for Django. Basically, we do the DevOps so that you can get on with being a programmer. We use Docker and Django and all those things. Come and talk to me about that afterwards, because I'll be very happy to talk to you about that. I'm involved in Django itself. I'm on the core team of the Django project. And I'm vice president of the Django Software Foundation. And I'm sad to say it's probably not as glamorous as you might imagine. Um, another thing that I'm involved in um, a great deal is the Python in Africa movement. And uh, Naomi mentioned this uh, that this morning in her keynote. So particularly in PyCon Namibia, which has been running things since um, 2015, those are some of my friends from uh, PyCon Namibia. And since then, we've had uh, PyCons in Zimbabwe, in uh, Nigeria, and now in this year, uh, I'll be going to PyCon Ghana for the first time. And there are plans afoot for a pan African PyCon, too. Um, and uh, it's not just people like me going to Africa or events happening in Africa. Um, African Pythonistas are becoming more and more involved in our community. So the Django Software Foundation and the Python Software Foundation both have African women on their boards just in the last um, year or so. I think that's really something. And the last thing I want to mention is I'm one of the organizers of PyCon UK. So if you're not tired of conferences, and I hope you won't be after just uh, a weekend of, of this one, there's another one in, in Cardiff in September 15th to the 19th. Um, our call for proposals is still open for another six days, so I, I've mentioned that to most people I've spoken to already, but the rest of you, please go and have a look at our website. Think about coming to Cardiff. It's a, it's a, a very nice conference. If you've enjoyed this one, I'm sure um, you'll enjoy that too. And finally, if you need my contact details, there they are. But the best thing is just to come and talk to me. Now that you know what I look like, you'll find me easily. So um, uh, let's get to work, because I want to talk about the naive programmer. And I mean the naive programmer. I don't mean, you know, I don't mean the bad programmer or the ineffective programmer or the programmer that you don't want to have on your team. I just mean the unsophisticated programmer. And nobody is born sophisticated. Um, so even if you're a very sophisticated programmer, you were once naive yourself. And the naive programmer is absolutely everywhere, because every programmer starts out being naive. Um, and I'm a pretty naive programmer myself. So in, in some respects, um, I'm quite sophisticated. I know to spell naive with two dots on the eye, and also that they're called a diuresis. So I, I imagine I'm quite sophisticated. But as a programmer, maybe not so, not so much. So um, here's the naive programmer. Keep in mind that I'm self-taught. So my code may be a little messy. I know programmers love XKCD, so uh, this is a, an XKCD cartoon for almost every conference talk. So here's the naive programmer engaging, engaging in a, an encounter with someone else. We'll come back to this in a minute. 
Now, to understand sophistication and naivety in programming, we have to understand programming as a craft. And uh, programming is a craft, or an art, or a skill, and I will use those three words completely interchangeably. Um, and we need to understand some of the characteristics of arts or crafts in order to understand programming, uh, therefore. Obviously, everybody would like to be better. Oh my goodness, I can just see <laughs> that I changed a word and forgot to change the other word. Well, how embarrassing. I'm going to stand in front of it. Everybody would like to be better at their craft. <laughs> so, so, so failure of quality control. Um, and it doesn't matter. Let's skip that. Uh, I'll have to leave it there for a minute. Uh, embarrassing. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are or, or how sophisticated you are, how expert. You still want to be better at your craft as much as the most naive and inexpert craftsperson wants to be. Now, of course, thank God he got rid of that. There are completely different kinds of arts that are, or crafts. There are aesthetic arts which are measured against human judgment. So you have critics who um, will measure your work, and like fine art or poetry or, or, or music. And in these arts, you can engage in a dialogue with your critics. And you know, you might be right, and your critics might be wrong. Maybe they just haven't caught up with your. Uh, uh, with what you've come up with yet. But in um, practical arts, your critic is the world, and you don't get to argue with the world. You know, if, if the bridge falls down, um, it's not a critic that has a say whether your work was a success. It's whether your program runs, whether your bridge stays up. And um, if you're a programmer, then you'll find that uh, the Python interpreter is a very harsh critic. And you can't argue with it, or, or plead, or threaten, or any of those things. It, uh, or I've tears. You know, I've tried all those things. Um, here's another difference between arts. Some arts are repeatable, like um, the business of landing an aircraft. It's expected, if you're a pilot, that you will land an aircraft in the same way every time. Or, or if you're a surgeon, that you'll perform a procedure in the same way every time. But some arts are creative like painting or musical photography. And this is really important because in these arts, when we create a new program or a painting, we're creating something that didn't exist before. We start with a blank page. So some are creative and, and some uh, are repeatable. And you know, if you go into the theater to see an avant-garde improvisation, that might be quite nice. But if you go into the operating theater and find out that it's going to be an avant-garde improvisation, um, you'll think maybe that you'll go to a different theater instead. So anyway, programming is one of those creative crafts, or arts, or whatever you want to call it. And this means that even though programmers are not uh, painters, or photographers, or, or musicians, uh, that in one respect, they're doing the same thing as other artists, and that is that they are practicing a creative skill. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about these uh, people shortly. Um, I d does anybody know who they are? Does anybody recognize any of them? M Naomi, it's true, they are too young, I think. Um, so I'm also older than you think. So, you know, all bold men look the same age, I think, or something. Um, anyway, we can't, we shouldn't talk about um, artists just being worse or better as though they were somewhere on a one-dimensional line, because that's very reductive. It's not a good picture of artistic prowess. Um, all kinds of things matter in, in uh, art or craft. Technique, creativity, uh, judgment, and sophistication. And they're part of what it is to be a complete artist. You are not a complete artist if you lack in any of one of these qualities. So artist who lacks uh, technique, we call inept. The artist who lacks creativity is dull. Uh, the one who lacks judgment is uncritical. And the one who lacks sophistication is naive. And to be sophisticated means to be educated. I don't necessarily mean that you've been through formal training or you've had a formal education. I just mean that you have been brought along in a culture and versed in its traditions, uh, able to meet its, able to understand and meet its uh, uh, standards. 
And you can't become sophisticated on your own. You can only become sophisticated through education in a culture. So the sophisticated artist is in a kind of dialogue with their own art, with the practices and the theories and the history and the traditions of their art. Um, and let's meet a sophisticated artist to understand this uh, better. This is um, Georges Braque. Uh, he's one of the giants of Western art. He exemplifies every kind of artistic excellence, the epitome of artistic sophistication. He was a, a sculptor and a collagist and turned his hand to all kinds of things. But above all, he's known as a painter of exceptional ability and achievement. And even as a very young man, he had uh, an obvious talent. Um, but then in his, um, sorry, even as a, a young boy, I meant to say, because as a young man in his 20s, he had a couple of encounters, first with the Fauvists and then with Paul Cezanne. And they, those encounters turned him into a world-changing painter. Uh, Paul Cezanne um, pursued innovations in form and structure and perspective, and, these, and he raised all kinds of questions about, uh, uh, about them. And he ignited a revolution because um, Georges Braque, together with Picasso, tried to answer those questions, and together they invented Cubism, which is probably the most single, most significant development in art in the 20th century. And um, Cubism is not just a style or way of painting. It was a deeply intellectual, theoretical struggle with questions about reality and its representation. It represents an engagement that reaches across multiple, multiple dimensions, uh, back in time to argue with the history of painting across the arts to engage with um, uh, developments in fiction and poetry and music, or across cultures to uh, Eastern or African uh, art. And it also draws in scientific and mathematical discoveries or new political ideas or technological developments and philosophical arguments. It, it was all-encompassing, and it drew things in from every possible angle. And Braque was an artist genuinely in total command of his craft. He was able to pull everything together in layer upon layer of intelligence and meaning, and then speak back to the world through his art. And he brought something so compelling to his dialogue um, with uh, his uh, discipline that it could never be the same again. So he's an example of sophistication at the highest possible level of this matchless artistic intelligence. And it's key to what allows us to call Braque a complete artist. Now, I don't mean that to be a, a complete practitioner, you need to be a George Braque. I just, he's just a good example, and I like his uh, pictures. Uh, you can be a master of your craft without actually being a giant of the, of the discipline. Um, the important thing is you need one of the things that Braque has, which is the ability to address your craft with sophistication. Now, painting isn't programming, but sophistication applies to programming in just the same way. It's, essential, it's an essential dimension of the mastery of the craft. And there are programmers who have this mastery of their craft, as well as their, you know, they have technical and creative and critical faculties, but they also have an ability to think richly and deeply and broadly about what it is they're doing in programming. And faced with any programming challenge, they can draw upon resources that stretch, uh, that come from every direction. They're versatile and powerful. They see parallels and connections, and they can, relationships and tensions that uh, less sophisticated programmers would have no access to. They work with concepts and ideas, some of which come from other disciplines, that allow them to describe and conceptualize their problem field in a way that simply wouldn't be possible for others. So the sophisticated programmer draws from a, uh, from, from a deeper well. And that's the programmer that we want to be, in possession not just of technical or creative or um, critical strengths, but also this intellectual um, depth, educated um, sophistication. It's one of the powers of the artist. On the other hand, uh, just as the sophisticated artist can help us 
understand what it is to be a sophisticated programmer, I think that the naive artist can help us understand what it is to be a naive programmer. So let's meet a naive artist. Um, here's the first person I showed. Here's Henri Rousseau, uh, sitting in front of one of his completely absurd paintings. He was the quintessential naive artist. As far as I know, he was the artist for whom the term naive art was invented. He had no education in art, and if he had influences, they were probably found on packets of sardines or something like that, or children's books. This is not somebody of the stature of Georges Braque that we're talking about. His work was, his work was coarse and buffoonish, and he painted in this flat, sorry, he painted in this flat primitive style with a, uh, a child's I don't think I can bear to be that near to that thing, actually. <laughs> he painted in this flat style with a child's grasp of perspective and anatomy. Um, you know, if you had an art teacher in high school, your art teacher probably had a better understanding of art than uh, Henri Rousseau, um, and probably had fewer limitations, too. Uh, his He became a legend. His understanding of color, for example, was so lacking that, according to the legend, anyway, he would go into art shops asking for tubes of paint, the right color for painting nudes. So he was a painter of immense deficits. Um, I mean, the main problem here is not a lack of sophistication, but uh, an excess of hideousness, I think, actually. So that, um, but some of his paintings are actually quite charming, like this one. Still, you know, no grasp whatsoever of things like anatomy or how bodies can be drawn, but there's some charm um, in there. Some critics felt that Rousseau was so oblivious to anything in arts and that his work was so devoid of thought or direction or intention that they couldn't even say much about it, that there was a total lack of intellectual curiosity in his work. And that meant there was nothing in his work that you could interrogate or learn about or inquire into or interpret or, or, or do anything as an art critic. And Actually, he was genuinely clueless, so he's on record as being asked about his favorite artists in the Louvre, and he said, well, there are so many, you can't remember all the names. So, in other words, he had no intellectual framework to order and understand um, the history of art and its traditions, his own discipline. Um, the best description I've read of him is that he has an intention deficit disorder. He, he just delivers paint onto a canvas without any understanding or idea of what he's doing or why. He's n he doesn't have a problem to solve. He's just an aimless hobbyist painter or some kind of amateurish bungler. And at the same time, he was desperate for recognition and ridiculed by the art establishment. So he was forever, well, not quite forever, but um, mostly an art outsider looking in longingly at the art world, but oblivious to his own inadequacies as an artist. And of the actual work that was taking place in the art world. And he thought he was a painter of great importance. And he relentlessly exhibited his, exhibited his pictures wherever he could. And although he loved and admired the works and the artists in the academy, it's pretty doubtful whether he could see past the surface of those canvases either. So he endured years of uh, sustained mockery from artists, critics, and the public, and people literally would queue up, would line up to laugh at his paintings when they were exhibited. Uh, one critic said, he paints as if with his feet, with a blindfold over his eyes. So that's the naive artist. This is like being in a house built by a child using nothing but a hatchet and a picture of a house. So here's the naive programmer, the amateurish bungler at work again. The naive programmer is as ripe for a laugh as uh, the naive artist, limited and unaware of their limitations. And this isn't a problem of style. You know, style guide is not going to solve this. Uh, it's not even that the, prob that the code may be a little messy. Uh, the, the problem is the code reviewer here hasn't actually identified the problems. The problem is that the, these are just symptoms. The problem is that the, uh, the programmer here has a crippling lack of resources to bring to the business of programming. The naive programmer's thinking is impoverished, and it comes out in their work. 
the naive programmer is a weaker, less effective, less complete craftsperson who will always be limited by their lack of sophistication. And it's not something to be proud of. But this is a funny thing, that this photograph of Henri Rousseau was taken by Pablo Picasso. Because, oh, here's Picasso again with another couple of uh, Rousseau's canvases. Um, Picasso was absolutely fascinated by, Braque, by Rousseau. Picasso was like uh, Braque, an artistic giant, but Rousseau had something that Picasso didn't and that Picasso wanted. Picasso saw in Rousseau's naivety not just a lack or something negative, a deficit, but also something positive, a new way of seeing and representing what is seen. And certainly, Rousseau lacked any sophistication, but as Picasso was, had enough insight to see, he had other things. He had a powerful artistic vision, and he burned completely obsessively with it. He developed a style and a language of painting that was all his own. And he may have been limited and confined to his particular style, but it was his invention, and he created it out of nowhere. So he was a genuinely creative um, artist in that respect. He may have been oblivious to the problems in art that others were trying to address. He may have been even unable to articulate his own problems in any satisfactory way. But I think that if you look at his art, you can see that he is struggling, however inadequately, with a genuine problem field of his own. So he was naive and unable to connect with the, the dialogue of the history of art. But other artists, more sophisticated than he, were able to do that work for him and to see the connections through his own work. He came, out of, he came up with something new and became part of the uh, history of art. So, without ever developing in sophistication, Rousseau became a major, major figure, a major painter in the history of art. He was an influence on Picasso, on the Cubists, on the Surrealists, on the German Expressionists, on um, Kandinsky, and then uh, became an important part of the whole story of, of modernism, which of course extends right beyond, um, far beyond art. So now, we have two different models for the encounter between sophistication and naivety uh, to work with. Um, we've got the example from modern art in which the naive is something that can be understood, valued, and learned from. And then we have this model. And I want to know, I have some questions about this because the fact is that even according to this, the naive programmer has built a house. Maybe there's something new in that building. Maybe there's something valuable worth learning from amidst the eccentricity and the bungling. What did the programmer discover along the way doing that? And the fact is that despite the lack of sophistication edu and uh, education, the naive programmer was able to create something worth reviewing in the first place. Maybe that's evidence of creativity, or vision, or insight, or maybe even just of perseverance. And all of those things, I think, are worth something. Maybe there's a natural talent there that just hasn't been educated yet. And the fact is that it compiled without errors. So he's not asking for his code to be debugged. He's asking for his code to be improved, to be made more sophisticated. He's trying to open up a dialogue. And I think that the naive programmer deserved much better than this particular sophisticated code reviewer, because she's not going to see past his lack of sophistication to anything of value that might be there in the code. Rousseau is one of many artists who is of complete naivety, who has made a serious contribution to art. And since Rousseau, art has been very alive and sensitive to what they might be able to offer. And if there are naive programmers um, with similar powers of vision and invention, then I think our world of software should be looking out for them too. Um, here's another naive artist, uh, Mike Disfarmer, a photographer, a small town ph photographer in um, uh, rural Arkansas where he maintained a, a portrait studio in Heber Springs, this tiny town of uh, one and a half thousand people. 
and he would make what were called um, penny portraits, or three for 50 cents in his basic, very basic studio. And he was so naive that he didn't even know he was an artist. Um, in fact, nobody knew he was an artist until about 20 years after his death, when a huge cache of all his negatives was discovered and published, and he became an international uh, sensation in photography in the 1970s. And all he did was take um, studio portraits of local people. Just his living, they would come on a Saturday to have their photos taken. He wasn't part of any art establishment. He wasn't up, even up to date with the basic developments in photography, so he didn't use an enlarger. Um, he made contact prints from his glass plate negatives for about 30 years after everyone else had started using film. So um, that would be like finding that somebody here is still storing their programs on punch cards because they hadn't heard about any other developments since then. Um, but what's really remarkable is, is, is this work that uh, he produced. So his unassuming portraits of these small town, mostly rather careworn looking um, people, and they weren't created as artworks, they were just his job. And these pictures are intimate and moving and really startling. They're composed with incredible um, skill and care. So for example, he was a master of, of lighting whose only source of lighting was a single north-facing skylight. Um, and you can see you know, the, um, the, the kind of tired hands and the sad eyes of uh, uh, the people in these pictures. This is a really sad picture. This is, um, her name is Emma May Hoy, and she's dressed up in a little bit of a sailor uniform because it was a present for her husband who was in the Navy, Navy during the Second World War. And these pictures are light years away from the typical output of the small town studios of that era. There are no cliches. He didn't retouch any photographs. He didn't use any of the standard proses that you will find in photos from that time. And that's probably because he was so naive, he didn't even know what they were. He hadn't even encountered or learned them. So they're, they're these songs of sadness and beauty, and he only has one song. It's always the same song, but it's such a beautiful one. The, like Rousseau, the only resources he had were his own. He had nothing else to draw upon. He wasn't part of any artistic culture, and unlike Rousseau, he didn't even have pretensions to join it. So these extraordinary photographs came from nothing but his astounding eye for people. And they're such beautiful compositions, and uh, I don't know if you can see them from every angle of the room, but. I can assure you, you do not make, get to make photographs like this unless you know exactly what it is that you're doing. And yet, this was the only thing he knew how to do. It was his only song. He didn't have versatility or range, and unlike Rousseau, it seems likely that he wasn't even aware of a world of art outside his studio that he wasn't a part of. He lived in his own little world, doing his job, making his pictures for his customers. And maybe, in programming, there are Mike disfarmers too, working away, producing little masterpieces of their own that nobody else knows about. And this is really important because not every programmer is or has to be a software professional. Some are just completely normal people who, for some reason, have dared to write a computer program. So think about all the offices and workplaces and factories and laboratories around the world where someone with a problem has allowed themselves to imagine that they could solve it all by themselves by writing a computer program. And we occasionally meet people like these, but they don't come to our Python uh, conferences. They've picked up a book on Python and, and learned something and built something. And they've done them in their own little worlds, not part of our culture, unaware of our wider culture, working in their own eccentric and peculiar and naive ways that they arrived at on their own because they found something that worked and nobody else was around to show them anything better or more sophisticated. And um, you know when you meet them because they're the ones who haven't heard of version control or separation of concerns or automated testing. Or you'll find them doing things like um, writing their code in Windows Notepad or using an online environment in a web browser um, because they couldn't get one working on their own computer. At the same time, software development is a profession. And like any profession, 
it has to put up barriers of exclusion, whether explicit or implicit, to maintain standards and quality, to guarantee, uh, the pro um, to protect the profession itself. Software professionals, I hope you agree, should not be using outdated practices or tools or, or, or doing things that uh, we regard as uh, poor practice. So in programming, programming, we very rightly tend to pay a lot of attention to how we work, and we don't hesitate to make comments and remarks about their tools and practices. But not every programmer has to be a software professional. So they don't need to be measured by those standards. And there are more of these programmers than you think. And they definitely aren't coming to our conferences. I want to know how many naive programmers are out there solving their problems in their own way, whatever way that works for them. And I'd like to know what things, what remarkable things they might be inventing all on their own. And, um, what problems are being solved unbeknownst to the rest of us. And I want to know, what is the implication of this for those programmers, even if it's not directed at them personally? Or even, what's the implication of this? for those programmers if they hear such a thing. Now, I mean, many of you know J Jacob, who, uh, as well as being an extremely accomplished programmer, um, is also a very kind and uh, generous man and wouldn't be using that to uh, put down anyone. It's not intended to put anyone down. At the same time, I wonder what it does for those naive programmers. And also, I don't think it's true, if I may dare to say that to uh, Jacob, because if a Django girl goes into work the week after her first introduction to programming and write a, writes a program that solves a problem, is it broken by design because she didn't write tests, or she wrote it in Python 2 or didn't use version control? Or if a graduate student in some lab uh, realizes that she can solve a problem for her lab with some code, are we entitled to call it broken in any respect, however deficient it might be by the standards of professional software developers? Or what about the designer who puts together a few lines of code in Django for the first time and creates something that stores and publishes um, uh, a bit of data that he needed to display on his website? Under what circumstances do we get to call those things broken because they don't conform to the standards of our profession? And we're putting programming into the hands of more and more people, like primary school children, for example, whom we don't expect all to become software professionals. We don't expect all these people to have formal professional training as programmers. We just want them to know a little bit about programming so that they can use it in their lives and work. And if we're going to do that, we're going to find that increasing numbers of people are these uh, naive programmers. And these people absolutely rightly will consider that programming is just a means to their ends. The only purpose of it is to solve their problems. That's the only standard that they're interested in. So we better get used to having more of these naive programmers around us and also used to having less room for making confident proclamations about what is broken by design. Here's my final choice for exploring artistic naivety. Uh, when I was a teenager, did nobody recognize this? Oh, maybe well, I've got to put a name there. When I was a teenager, I discovered that the records of talking heads and that turned out to be a really important part of my education. Um, this is the Tina Weymouth, the bass guitar player of Talking Heads. And um, I was a little bit you know, in love with her, I think, still, because you know, I thought she was the coolest thing ever. And here, here are all the Talking Heads, and um, people really admired them for their incredibly long necks. Uh, yeah, let's just look at that. So between 1977 and 1988, they released 10 albums of exceptional creativity and quality. As artists, they hit the ground running. Um, they were already quite sophisticated in their approach to their craft because they'd all, in fact, been to art school. And they followed their first record with three more that they recorded with Brian Eno of increasing depth and complexity. And their work progressively digs deeper and reaches further. And at first, I mostly just liked the sound 
they made. I like the sound of the music. But later, through reading about them, not on my own, because as I said, sophistication comes through education. You can't become sophisticated on your own. I realized that something else was going on. And this was my first introduction, my first real, uh, my first real understanding of sophistication as an artistic quality. And you can play these records one after the other and trace this artistic journey, this development. And there's the immediate response to the music. Um, but then you, there's this other level to explore that also itself yields more and gives back more um, as their sophistication as artists deepened. And by the time of their fifth studio album, um, they were masters of their craft. And the, you know, the speaking in tongues, their, their fifth studio album was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. That's how important they were. Uh, they followed up speaking in tongues with a tour um, from which the concert film Stop Making Sense uh, was made, directed by Jonathan Demi. And this film is described often as being one of the best concert films ever made. Now, since it's a genre mostly filled with garbage, that doesn't necessarily mean very much. But actually, it is a, a rather uh, brilliant film. So here they are in an, uh, it's a rather low resolution, but um, with an expanded nine-piece version of their band, captured at a moment of total artistic triumph. I imagine that you know God probably sometimes watches this film just to remind himself how good it is. And what makes something like this worth returning to over and over again is its multidimensionality, uh, its multiplicity of, of layers, of connections, uh, the fact that it has the same depth of artistic and intellectual curiosity that you will find in the work of someone like Georges Braque. Now, for Talking Heads, a really important part uh, aspect of this sophistication was the attention they paid to practice. And this is something that programmers, like many other artists, are familiar with. Programmers are fascinated by process and practice. Sometimes it seems they are more interested in that than in what they actually produce while they're practicing. Um, so here's a nice joke I've found about programmers and musicians. So I don't know if you can see this. Here's work inventing electronic music, st standing desks, and scrum meetings all at the same time. So of course programmers love that because it's about programmers. And programmers are really convinced that they just have to get the process right and everything else will, will, will work. Um, and that's something that they do share with, with artists. Uh, and attention to practice is something you see in sophisticated craftspeople. The artist Peter Schmidt collaborated with Brian Eno, uh, producing a set of cards for creative practitioners called Oblique Strategies. And they're intended for artists to pull out in the, at work to suggest a, um, a course of action or a change in thinking to, um, to assist. So um, we have, what wouldn't you do? Or abandon normal instruments, or give way to your worst impulse. And he, uh, Eno used these cards with David Bowie on the three albums they recorded in Berlin. Um, Talking Heads recorded three albums with Eno as well, but they didn't use uh, the oblique strategies, actually, because they'd already been to art school. They were already acutely aware of process and practice in art. And they had their own strategies to freshen stale habits and unblock stalled creative efforts. And their favorite technique was to swap instruments with each other in the studio so that each musician was playing something they weren't that good at. Uh, this is often how they composed music, uh, but through improvising. And swapping these instruments was a way of forcing themselves into a sideways turn, um, out of ruts, out of uh, dead ends, out of tired old grooves. Because with unfamiliar instruments in their hands, their playing became less expert and had to be simpler. And they made more mistakes, and they stumbled across more unexpected things. It made them less sophisticated and more naive. They went deliberately into the naive to bring forth something new. As a band, Talking Heads reinvented themselves seriously and continually and surprisingly for their entire existence with great sophistication. And one key to their ability to do this um, was their understanding of the power of naivety in creative work. Uh, how are we doing for time? Somebody got another 20 minutes? So um, for much of the Speaking in Tongues record, they, Talking Heads explored this very dark uh, tone, 
Um, it's, it's kind of seething and festering with, with menace and paranoia. Uh, it opens with a song burning down the house, which itself opens with a, a warning, watch out. And so it's a very sinister record, and uh, many of the songs seem to conjure up images or impressions of uh, you know, madness or sin or some kind of disaster licking at the edges of, of the world. Um, and, and they've marshaled this brilliantly, and they're doing exactly what they wanted to do. You can tell this is a, a group of artists right in complete command of what they're doing. But the last song on the record, This Must Be The Place, takes a completely different turn. It's the most beautiful song on the album, and it's the smallest, simplest song. Uh, it's so small and simple and unassuming that most reviewers, at the, or many reviewers at the time, somehow didn't even notice it was there. Uh, it just has three chords all the way through. And it has a parenthetical title, which is completely accurate. And it's unlike pretty much any other Talking Heads song until that point, and the most tender. So we've got this record of this sidewinding, swampy funk. Um, and arriving at this song is like arriving at a gentle dawn and blinking into it after you spent a, a, a turbulent night in the company of demons and exorcists. So it's a very strange ending for that record, because speaking in tongues, it starts with a, uh, a song about burning down the house, and it ends with a song about being home. And when you look back, you can see this song as a signpost of the direction the band would take over the next two studio albums, an explicit artistic inquiry into the possibilities of naivety. So not much was said about that song at the time, but in the intervening 35 years, it seems to have become quite important. It's taken on a life of its own, mainly in the last 10 years. Mostly Talking Heads songs have not been adopted or recorded by other musicians. They seem to resist it somehow. But This Must Be The Place has been recorded many times. Um, it's been used in numerous film soundtracks. There's even a, even a Paolo Sorrentino film named after it with um, Sean Penn. I haven't seen this. I just discovered this while I was um, researching this. And my question is, why has this little song flowered so late in life. Um, there's much richer material on the record. It's not the song that I would have expected to suddenly flower 35 years later. But there's now a generation of people for whom this is the best known song, often because other people have recorded it, maybe because of its simplicity uh, that allows it to function as a canvas. Uh, maybe it gives people more room to understand it in their own way. Uh, maybe its naivety uh, speaks more directly to people. Talking Heads were very serious in this pursuit of naivety. This was the record, uh, Little Creatures After Speaking in Tongues. This is a painting by um, Howard Finster, who's another very well-known naive artist. So they were very deliberately diving in down that, that, that road. Now, earlier I said that um, being naive is not a thing to be proud of. I, I, I think that's, that's true. It would be like being proud of being, proud of being ignorant. And sophistication is necessary to be a complete programmer, and its absence is a deficit. But sophistication is not all that's required to be in command of your craft. And it's not a substitute for any of the other things, for technique or creativity or judgment. And worse, the pursuit of sophistication can come at their expense. And the artist can become jaded and stale. And the history of art is littered with artists whose sophistication left no room for those other qualities. And I'm pretty sure the same has happened to programmers. And if I had to choose, I would rather be a naive expert, sorry, a naive inexpert programmer with a creative vision than a sophisticated expert who could solve all the standard problems, but who had ceased to invent any new problems of their own to explore. And as a completely naive programmer, when I started, I labored on my own inventions. And I imagined that, you know, like Rousseau, they might set a little bit of the world on fire. And, and they didn't. But, you know, I managed to do certain things that stuck, which is why I'm now standing here in front of you with the honor of, of speaking to you. Uh, many of you will genuinely be much more sophisticated programmers than I will um, ever be. So it's especially um, nice for me to have that honor. And if you saw my code, probably even now, it was a little bit messy. And my code, when I wrote it, didn't have 
tests, and it wasn't elegant, and perhaps in some way it was some, like something built by a child with only a vague idea of how to do it and little idea of how to use the tools. It was naive. But more importantly for me, it worked. And I built a house, if you want to call it that, and the house stood and it did the job it was supposed to do, and it did it much better than the creations of some much more sophisticated and, I should say, expensive programmers uh, had worked. It delivered the institution that I was working for uh, something that it very badly needed, and it saved it many thousands of pounds over several years. As a means to an end, it was a success. It served the institution, and it served the people who worked there. So it was of value, and I can be proud of that. So these figures and stories that I've discussed all represent different models of the relationship between sophistication and naivety. And of all of them, this is the only one without any value. Um, you, should be able to, you should be sophisticated enough to recognize deficits in others' sophistication, but what will you miss out on if your only response to naivety is dismissiveness or ridicule? What harm will you do and what will you fail to learn? So without sophistication, you're an incomplete programmer. It matters. Its absence is a deficit in both the art and the artist. If you're aspiring to mastery of your, of your craft, you need to develop this sophistication along with your other qualities. Now, Georges Braque was a complete artist, but you don't need to be a Georges Braque to be a sophisticated artist, a master of your craft. And frankly, you're not going to be a Georges Braque. You can settle for being a good, sophisticated programmer, not a world-changing one. So you need to try and be like Georges Braque in your work. And you're probably not going to be a Picasso either. But you can be like Picasso, a sophisticated practitioner who is able not just to see past the deficits and limitations of the naive to its powers and gifts, but also to take advantage of them. Or you could be like talking heads, sophisticated masters of their art, swapping instruments deliberately in the studio to draw upon the naive as a creative resource, uh, finding new ways to uh, remain fresh and inventive, stepping outside sophistication deliberately to allow new and unexpected solutions to reveal themselves. Or maybe you'll never be sophisticated, like Henri Rousseau. But still, it would be a prouder thing to be a Rousseau, whatever your limitations, producing work of incandescent invention than to be a tired old sophisticate of the, of the academy. And if you're a programmer, however naive, you have every right to be proud when you exercise your powers and you solve problems, whoever those problems belong to, whether, only or all, whether they are only yours or small ones. Even if your grasp of the craft is in some respects badly deficient, if you solve problems for anyone, that's something to be proud of. Or you could be a disfarmer, so naive that you're barely aware of the culture and traditions of your craft, but working quietly, producing modest creations of unassuming beauty. In other words, as a programmer producing work of small but meaningful value to someone, however naive and limited your style might be. So these are useful ways for us to think about our relationship with our craft. And if I've said just one thing that makes a single programmer feel better about their lack of expertise, or makes a single programmer hesitate before pouring scorn on the naive, then I think that's worth something. And in modern art, since the early 20th century, the naive has had a really important and influential place. The adventures of Henri Rousseau took place more than a century ago, and he lacked sophistication. He was an incomplete, lesser, flawed artist. But whatever his artistic deficits, we now judge him much more kindly then we judge the sophisticates who ridiculed and dismissed him at the time. Because he lacked sophistication, but they lacked artistic vision, and that's much worse. And I can't wait for programmers to learn the same lessons. Thank you very much. And, and, uh, and I apologize because I was generously given a few more minutes and I greedily took them. <laughs> so. Okay, so we have a few more questions. If
It's fairly simple economic theory that the more you restrict entry into a profession or an occupation, the higher the rewards for being in that occupation is. The classic example for this is um, taxi drivers with their licenses. So is there not a, a challenge that whilst intellectually and morally we think we should try and encourage naivety, in terms of hard cash, actually scorning amateurs is in all of our interests? I, I don't want... I don't want to encourage naivety necessarily, unless you're pursu pursuing it deliberately as a, an artistic strategy. But I want to encourage people who are people who are naive, not to feel excluded and to have a go, and to encourage people who are sophisticated to look past the limitations of the naive. Now, I think I said earlier that software development is a profession and must protect itself. You, you, you won't want to fly on an airplane. Uh, whose software has been programmed by naive bunglers. So I'm not saying that it's, it's not important and the industry needs to protect itself in that way. But there's a lot more than just this narrow uh, industry, I think. And I think that's where the opening should be. And after all, of course, naive people do become sophisticated through education if they want to. Thank you for that talk, very uh, thought-provoking. I'm not sure what I'm thinking, but I'm thinking <laughs> about stuff. So uh, what kind of techniques have you come across in your journey to kind of this realization to kind of how can we help stir up that process? Because it seems like once you get it, you're like, ah, this is why something was done that way. And kind of um, uh, while also trying to balance me as like a t t as a team leader, it can kind of sometimes be, you can be accused of being indulgent in kind of, if you need to stop and think and, you know, what does this mean? Kind of what practical things have you seen to kind of help um, uh, push people either up the sophistication curve or to help someone come down to it to maybe make a breakthrough? It depends on, on your team, I think. So if your team is of professional software developers, I think it's part of their professional obligation to develop this sophistication. So uh, people would regard regarded. Uh, Rousseau as having failed in his artistic obligations because of his lack of intellectual cur cur curiosity. And professional software developers who lack that intellectual curiosity about their own work are prob possibly in the wrong profession. But that doesn't mean, but not every programmer has to be one of those. And there can be programmers doing very valuable work. So, for example, your team of professionals might work with designers or data scientists or, 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 or human uh, interaction experts or something like that who see a way to solve a problem with some code. Now, it would be a mistake to apply the standards of the software professionals onto those people, but you have to find a way for those people to work uh, together. So maybe the software professionals need to become better at turning these insights from these more naive programmers into something more robust and saleable and sustainable? I'm not quite sure if I answered your question, but I did my best. That's a reminder. So what were your milestones on the journey from naive to sophisticated programmer? My milestones. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an, I am a naive programmer. I'm still a naive uh, programmer. I'm not a sophisticated programmer, and I don't think I'm ever going to be. So most of my work, uh, I do programming, but um, you know, I'm slower than my colleagues. Uh, I think of duller ways of doing things, but I've got other. Um, I bring other benefits to the team. So they don't need me to do that kind of thing. And I do regret not having that, but maybe it would come at the expense of other things that I'm more sophisticated in, like, like spelling. <laughs> so you can't have everything. You're, I started programming at the age of 39. So you know, some, some of you have had a head start. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm a naive programmer. Somehow I got into the industry yes. via journalism. Um, should I bother becoming sophisticated? Um, 
Well, you know, the, the sophisticated, it, it's an education. It's out there for you to take. And this is what's so interesting. So I love listening to programmers talk about uh, you know, the way these concepts fall under their hands. So I was standing with a programmer at the traffic lights, and he pressed a button, he said, ah, um, greedy consumption of green signals. You know, th these jokes just, you know, these, uh, they have access to all this stuff, and, and I think it's really empowering. And there's a lot to learn from that. But maybe your background is in something else, and you will bring in something that those programmers, especially if they've been programmers since the age of 18, and the only job they know is making code do the things they want. Maybe as a journalist, you have an understanding about what the code should do in a satisfactory society, or, or um, you might have ideas about how people understand information that a young programmer, or even an old programmer, uh, does not. So. Um, it, it, I'm not going to give you career advice on your path, but I mean, you know, I, I would never, I would never, say, you know, it's not a thing to be proud of to be naive. But if that's what you are, then you are, and you can still be proud of your work. It's just, you know, one doesn't want to make a um, uh, to wave a flag boasting of being naive. That that to me doesn't make sense. But your work, by all means, be proud of that. So, uh, comment and then a question. The comment is. Uh, I don't know what the word for below naive is, but, but that's how I felt when I, you know, with all the art stuff, and I, that's really inspired me to kind of go away and learn more about my art history and all of those things. So thank you very much for that. Um, but uh, the question is, uh, so who is who would you consider uh, to be sophisticated when it comes to software? Like, do you have some role models that, if I, because at the minute I don't know what it might mean <laughs> to be sophisticated. Um, almost. Uh, for me, the most obvious uh, people are some of my colleagues, for example, who are extremely sophisticated in the way they're able to think about problems in, in programming, uh, which sometimes literally leaves me feeling awed. You know, when I say something's awesome, I don't mean just quite nice. I mean, literally, I feel awed by it. Um, or, or my colleagues on the Django core team. There, there are some people there who are not just the best programmers in our community. They must be some of the best programmers I I in the industry, in, in the way they uh, work. Uh, probably there are some of those people in this room. Anyone who is a master of their craft can fill you with a bit of awe when you see them get to work. for your talk. I'm just wondering, is it possible for a sophisticated programmer to lead innovation in the world in any field such as science or medicine or anything else? I don't see why not, as long as they have the requisite um, skills and capacities for them to be able to step outside maybe the slightly narrow world of programming in, into the, the rest of the world. I, I, I'm a bit nervous when I see um, software-led innovations in the world, like uh, Naomi's terrifying flying Uber car over the skies of Paris. You know, I'm not going to visit Paris for a while until that thing is grounded, that's for sure. Because I definitely don't trust programmers who are only programmers to lead very much except the development of software. Um, and this experience of the wider world that you want from a scientist or a, a politician or, or somebody in business, I think has to come from outside the world of programming. Because they might be sophisticated about programming, but they might be extremely naive about all kinds of other things uh, to our detriment. Oh, yeah. Hi, Daniela. Thanks for that. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what I try to grasp is that we have, we are talking about the naive and the expert as individuals. And I'll give you an example from my job uh, that I can solve the maths, I can write the basic algorithm, I can write you reports after reports on how things are calculated. I can do the basic uh, Python code. Then I need someone to take it from there yes. and uh, deliver a graphical user interface, solve all the take hinder problems that I will just throw in their yeah. way. So what if we have an artist one person does the sketch, and the artist that knows how to color, colors it, and we work in collaboration to make something of certain use. 
So what do you think of that, really? Can we ma match the naive and practical with the experts? This is the story of um, Henri Rousseau and, and Georges Braque that, you know, uh, sorry, of, of Rousseau and, and, and Picasso, that Rousseau, he had this insight or he had this vision and then he could only go so far because of his limitations. But it took someone like Picasso to actually understand even better than Rousseau understood what it was that Rousseau was doing. Because Rousseau had a vision, but he didn't really have much understanding of it. And he was scratching at his, he was scratching at his artistic problem, uh, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so successfully. But it, it, um, when you look at his work in, in the context of uh, the history of art and, for example, questions about perspective and uh, the use of color, and you see what Picasso does with those things, then um, without Picasso, I mean, in fact, without Picasso, Rousseau, we would probably wouldn't know much about Rousseau because Picasso one day stumbled across some frames of Rousseau's that were being sold to be painted over. He thought, this is fucking amazing. And uh, he championed Rousseau. Uh, there's, a very, there's a very famous, um, kind of symposium, a, a banquet that was held in Rousseau's honor. You might read about it, it's quite funny, by Picasso. It was slightly, uh, well, you'd, you'd have to read about it. But So I think that the naive programmer, if that's what you're describing yourself as, doing a particular task in engineering needs somebody who will champion her work, who will see past, maybe you've got some limitations in your code, and pull out the value help you pull out the value, help them help make that value stick in code that's really robust and works and can be delivered to do a real job. And you need that kind of sensitivity because if you have the unsophisticated code reviewer, that's running into a brick wall. Thank you very much, Danielle, for the talk.